Well, grace and peace, Ohio District Council of Pentecostal Churches. I am Suffragan Bishop Lawrence Nevels, the liaison for the North Ohio West region. And welcome to the Friday session of Morning Glory. God has blessed us all this week, and we are grateful and thankful for his sustained goodness and his grace uh, unto us. I want to establish the protocol to give recognition to our diocesan, the Honorable Bishop James W. Gators. We thank God for him and his leadership, pastor of Grace Apostolic Church in Columbus, Ohio, and the spiritual leader of the Ohio District Council, the third Episcopal Diocese of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Thank God for him, and we continue to pray for him. We also want to recognize our chairman, uh, District Elder Daryl W. Cummings, uh, pastor in Wheeling, West Virginia. And uh, we thank God for his leadership and we pray for him as he embraces this new assignment. I like to think of it as the anointed assignment that God has given to him. And so we here in the uh, now region are praying for our leaders. I am going to um, introduce to you the mistress of our service, our service um, uh, leader today in the person of Pastor Francine Brown. She serves as the angel at Peace uh, Tabernacle uh, Family Worship Center in the great city of Toledo, Ohio. And I'm asking her if she will take the helm at this point and uh, extend to you a further welcome and the purpose for our gathering. Pastor Brown. Thank you. Uh, praise the Lord and greetings to everyone. Uh, we are so glad you tuned in to be with us today in our service and our prayers are that you will enjoy our service. I want to also uh, make known and mention and welcome the now churches in this region. We have Emmanuel Temple, Sandusky, Ohio, Bishop R.G.W. Sanders is pastor. Christ Church Triumphant, Toledo, Ohio, Bishop Scott Dibert, pastor. Christ Temple Church, Oberlin, Ohio, Suffolk Bishop Lawrence E. Nevels, our regional uh, diocesan. And a uh, true light Pentecostal Holiness Church, Toledo, Ohio, District Elder Sylvester Oz is the pastor there. And yours truly has been mentioned for Peace Tabernacle, but also New Life House of Faith, Toledo, Ohio, Pastor Jermaine McCullough. We are so thankful that we're all here today. And we want you to enjoy what God has given us to share with you at this time we're going to go into our devotional service and it's going to be under the instruction of District Elder Sylvester Alls. God bless you, sir. Okay, go ahead. Praise the Lord, everyone. Greeting in the precious name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. We like to just thank everyone for tuning in to our morning worship service. We thank the Lord. We certainly want to give honor to our diocesan, Bishop James Gators and Lady Marcia uh, Gators, and also to our council president, uh, District Elder Darrell Cummings and First Lady Cummings, and also to the entire executive board and ministers and pastors who are listening and tuning in. Certainly it's been a blessing to be a part of this uh, Ohio District Council and to serve uh, under the region. Also uh, give honor to our, our now region, uh, uh, this uh, Suffolk Bishop Lawrence Nevels and uh, Lady Lois Nevels. We thank the Lord for him and his leadership. And under his leadership, the Lord had blessed us and even the churches to go forward in Jesus' name. I just thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I have a scripture, uh, Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold fast 
the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Let us hold fast. If there ever was a time that we need to hold fast in this day and time during this global pandemic, this is the time to hold fast. I know there's been a struggle, but let us hold fast our faith. And we believe that God is going to bring us out of this pandemic. Yes. And every dispensation, every period, God had a man or a woman to bring us from one dispensation to the next. And we're living in the dispensation of grace. And I believe the grace of God is going to bring us out of this situation that we're in. And we're thankful for you joining us. And we're just going to go into a praise song that has been on my mind, has to do with the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is so important, apply, applying the blood. It's through the blood, for the Bible says, for the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the blood, I want to talk through the blood of the everlasting covenant. It's through God's blood that we're redeemed, through God's blood that we're saved, and through God's blood we're anointed, and through God's blood we're going to go back with the Lord. I just want to sing this song with my wife just to open up a little devotion about the blood. You don't have to slay the lamb anymore. You don't have to put the blood over the door. Jesus has taken the place of the lamb. He is the great I am. My wife going to help me sing it, and we, that's going to be our and devotional our song. Okay? Anybody can help us sing it. You don't have to slay Man. The lamb, the lamb anymore. anymore. You, you don't, don't have, have to put the blood over the door. door. Jesus has taken the place of the lamb. He is a great I am. Oh, you don't have to slay the lamb anymore. You don't have to put the blood over the door. Jesus has taken the place of the lamb. He, he is the great, great I am. am. He is the great. He is the great I am. I am. He is the great. He is the great I am. I am. He is the great. He is the great I am. I am. Oh, Jesus is, is the great, great I am. May God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. All right, we thank God for that devotional. God bless you, uh, Lady Oz and, and our district elder. We are so thankful that the blood has been applied. And we are honored today. And uh, it's time, I know our, uh, our bishop, our Suffolk Bishop had asked for some testimonies concerning the pandemic. And uh, if there is someone that wanna chime in at this time, go right ahead. We don't want to draw it out, but go ahead and, and give your testimony. One to two minutes. Uh, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> praise the Lord. My name is Sister Lee Pollard. Uh, Bishop just now asked me to give a minute or so of uh, testimony of the pandemic. <clears throat> I want to give honor to God, who uh, the head of my life and give honor to my bishop and elect lady nevels um, and to all the bishops and district elders and pastors and leaders uh, who are listening today. And it is a pleasure to uh, charm in, to be on today and here. And I thank God for um, keeping me and taking me through this pandemic. I have two daughters. I have five kids. I have two sons and three daughters and I had two of my daughters who are in uh, the healthcare uh, field and they was um, attacked by the um, coronavirus. One uh, lost her taste and her um, smell by the uh, pandemic and the other one um, she had the sore throat and she lost her taste and so they was uh, one had to uh, not work for 14 days and the other one, she was allowed to work in, uh, on the corona uh, floor. So it affected them a little bit. 
but I thank and praise God that they wasn't hospitalized and um, God kept them and God uh, sustained them. So I thank and I praise God for how he kept them and how he didn't allow them that they didn't have to be on a respirator. Uh, they didn't have to be uh, pinned down where they, you know, wasn't attacked so bad. But I had a nephew, my sister's son, he had to be uh, hospitalized and he has not returned uh, back to work yet, but God is still good. So I thank and I praise God for how he is uh, taking care of us and how he is still being God all by himself. Even though this uh, pandemic is uh, still rising, uh, this pandemic is still doing what it's doing, uh, this coronavirus is still attacking, but through it all, God is still God. God is still doing what he said he's going to do. He is still healing. He is still saving souls. He is still doing what God said he can, he can do and will do. So all we have to do is continue to walk in faith and continue to trust in God. And so I have learned that uh, what my pastor teach us to do is to trust God and lean on our faith and walk in it and know that God is God. So I thank and praise God that the leadership that I am under, that he is preaching and teaching the word of God. So I thank you guys again. And I ask to continue to pray for us and we will continue to pray for you all. So thank you. Amen. God bless you. That was beautiful. We thank God. It's always good to give him a praise. Amen. I, I can thank the Lord, too, because early on in the month of March, when all this broke out, my doctor admitted me with pneumonia. I was in there for three days, not on a ventilator, couldn't have any visitors, but I stood on the word of God. My son, my children, I couldn't talk to them, couldn't see them. That was a great test for me because I, I, I'm used to my kids being around me. And so I said to the Lord on that third day, I said, Lord, enough is enough. Because I had spoken to my son and he says, Mom, we're not, we're not doing good. And I knew for him to say that, I needed to get up out of there. So I told the Lord, I said, Lord, this is it. I am going home today. And when the nurse came in, I told her I wanted to see the doctor. I didn't see him the day before. She said, you didn't see the doctor? I said, no, I didn't see him. I said, but I want to see him today because I'm going home today. And she said, you know, it's a good thing for you to see him because right now we don't know what to do with you. And so a couple of hours passed and he came in and he had on his, he looked like he was in a space suit and he came close to me and said, Mrs. Brown, I said, yes. He said, uh, we took a test and it came back positive, but the numbers don't make sense. And I can't even justify keeping you in here. The reason I was in there as long as I was, somebody had given me a steroid shot that ran my sugar numbers up to 600 and they were taking my blood work around the clock. And so when I told him I'm going home today, he said, I'll have to let you go home. Uh, what do you need? I said, I need you to tell me what time I can tell my husband to pick me up. <laughs> he said, how about three o'clock? I said, that's fine. So I know if you stand on God's word, and I felt that old devil trying to oppress me, but I refused, and I reminded him I'm covered by the blood, and no weapon that's formed against me is going to prosper. And I tell you, God gave me the victory. I was home that evening before six o'clock and I wasn't sick. He said, I'm not gonna send you home with no medicine because I can't see anything wrong with you. And I just give God the praise. I'm so thankful God is a good God. Amen, saints. Now, a part of my responsibility was to, to kind of let you know what we're doing with this service today. We're going to be dealing with the feast and, and what we want us to walk away from here with is knowing what God is saying to his people today. 
In the Bible, God reveals his plan for mankind through seven annual festivals, each with its own important meaning. The first three festivals was the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Pentecost, which gives us the opportunity to reflect on the events that have already taken place in history and consider how in each one of these, how they have impacted our lives as Christians. And the last of the feast of, the, of these uh, four festivals are in the autumn season of the holy day. Of I don't know how much of that you heard, but the last four festivals are in the autumn and the Holy Land, uh, according to that calendar. So the Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and there's another one, the Eighth Day, which is also referred to as the last great day. All right. And so uh, Today, we're going to find out what God is saying to the church. Can you hear me? All right. I want to give you those calendar dates in the month of autumn for these particular feasts, uh, festivals. The Feast of Trumpets is September the 9th of 2021. Day of Atonement uh, and, and the Feast of Tabernacle. Here we have September for the Feast of Tabernacle. I'm sorry, the feast, uh, the day of atonement is for September the 21st through the 28th and the eighth day, September 29th through the 20th. But today we're going to hear from the presenters that are going to enlighten us as to what God is saying to us through the feast of trumpet, the days of atonement and the feast of tabernacle. And our first presenter is going to be Pastor Jermaine McCollum from uh, New Life House of Faith right here in Toledo. Pastor McCollum. God bless you. I'm so happy for the opportunity to be presenting on this afternoon or early mm -hmm. evening. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, Diocesan Bishop James Gators, um, and the uh, chairman, the council, uh, district elder, uh, Daryl Cummings, Suffolk and Bishop, Lawrence Nevels, uh, all of those that are here on today, Bishop Divert, God bless you, Pastor Brown, everyone uh, that's here and everyone that made this program possible. We're just so happy and excited uh, to share the word of God because we believe uh, that the word of God is relevant in any situation you might find yourself in. And these feasts are wonderful because I had to ask the Lord, I said, well, Lord God, what does these feasts have to say to us today? And the two feasts I'm going to be talking about are Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Very important uh, feasts, uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, which actually uh, got in the book of, of Numbers chapter 29, verses 1 through 6, in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 20, uh, 23 through 25, you can read that on your own time, but it meant uh, trumpet blasts. In other words, on the first day of the seventh month, uh, they were to blast the trumpet. The people of Israel uh, were to blast the trumpet, signifying 10 days of repentance uh, or days of awe. Very important, that trumpet, I just take a few seconds to talk about that, the Hebrew shofar, uh, that trumpet was very important because that trumpet uh, signified, it signified uh, what they had to do to repent, but it also uh, signified uh, the rapture. Um, in other words, we understand in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, it says, uh, for the trumpet shall sound and, uh, uh, and, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the, that shofar was very important. It was also something uh, that, was, that was blown on the day of atonement for the year of Jubilee. Very important uh, that we bring that out. But that trumpet, the Feast of Trumpets, I like to talk about just quickly, uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah. The Hebrew people would say, happy Rosh Hashanah. 
Shana, which means good year or happy new year, or the Hebrew Shana Tava. Uh, very, these were readings that were dear uh, to the Hebrew people of that time. But I want to just discuss quickly what that meant as far as the days of, of repentance, the 10 days of repentance. Uh, when we see in today's time, there's a lot of people that really come to God any kind of way. Uh, the Hebrew people understood uh, that these 10 days of repentance were to prepare them for the day of atonement. They understood that they could not come in the presence of God any kind of way. As a matter of fact, they weren't coming in the presence of God, but the priest, the high priest was coming in the presence of God, but they still had to be ready. Or we're living in a time where people are coming to God any kind of way. Uh, and we really need to put emphasis on the word repentance. And I believe we're not speaking about it much because it doesn't fill a lot of churches. It doesn't sell a lot of books and it doesn't get you a lot of cable TV time. <laughs> <laughs> but we understand uh, in God's mind that if we want to get to God, the first word we need to acknowledge is that we need to repent of our sins, not just not just the person. Pastor McCollum, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, sir, somehow you, you got muted. Continue. Okay. So the Feast of Trumpets signify 10 days of repentance, amen, or days of awe. This was a time where people did a lot of soul searching. Uh, there was a lot of introspection. In other words, they understood they were getting ready to go before God. In order for them to come before God, they had to be forgiven of their sins. And as I said earlier, we need to emphasize the need to repent in our messages when we're preaching. I believe that is the lost word now. In other words, people are talking about a lot of different things, but very few people are emphasizing the importance of repentance. So when they were preparing themselves to go before the Lord on the 10th day of the seventh month was the day of atonement. Day of Atonement was very important because we understand, according to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, uh, that God told Moses, he said, the people are not to come to me. Aaron, he told Moses, tell Aaron that he cannot come to me any time he wanted. In other words, he couldn't just get into the presence of God. Some of us feel that we can just get into the presence of God anytime we want, how we want. But he understood that in order for him to come into the presence of God, he had to be clear of any sins and he could not come any time. In other words, he only could come to God, what, once every year. What did he come with? He came with the blood of bulls and of goats. He sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat and he confessed the sins of God's people. And historians would say that the rope was to be tied around the high priest's leg so that if he went before the Lord and there was any sin in his heart uh, and he died, then, then they could pull him out. This goes according to the book of Leviticus chapter 16, verses one, he said, tell Aaron not to come before me anytime he want, lest he die. In other words, everything had to be right. Your heart had to be right. Your mind had to be right. You had to be forget. In other words, you had to make sure you're coming to God and you didn't have any sin on your heart. And, and that's something that is very significant in this time that we are living in. But that is that that the sack that day of atonement is very important because if we go to the book of uh, Hebrews chapter seven, verses 27, it speaks of the once and for all sacrifice. In other words, it wasn't just meant for then, it was meant for now. In other words, the same sacrifices that Aaron made year after year after year, Jesus became the once and for all sacrifice. According to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10, if you go to the book of Hebrews chapter seven, verses seven, we find that Jesus fulfilled the whole sacrificial system. And when he hung on that cross, understand what he said. He made a declaration. He said, it is finished. In other words, all the provision uh, that we need to live uh, a life of godliness, everything that we need was captured in his sacrifice. Mm. And what I wanted to, to bring out is if we do not if we do not appropriate the word of God and we do not act on the word of God, the provision that he has made by way of his atonement 
will never come to pass. What am I saying here? I'm saying that when he hung on that cross and he said it is finished, that completed the atone, his atoning work. And when he made that provision for us, he made it possible. In other words, he made it possible for us to activate our faith on his word. On his word. He made it possible for us to live holy. He made it possible for us to cast out devils. He made it possible for us to lay hands on the sick. But we, the people of God, must make it actual. And what I'm seeing is a lot of us are not releasing or acting on the word of God. We're not decreeing God's word like we should. And God wants us to get to a place where we begin to speak the word of God over every negative element that is opposed to us. There are many forces around you right now that want to take from what God has done in your life that want to take from what God is getting ready to do in your life. And you must understand, unless you are releasing God's word into what you want him to do, some of the things God can't do for you. I was preaching a message earlier today called Shake It Off and how things get attached to the people of God and hinder the people of God from moving forward. And a lot of times people don't understand that some of the power, that all of the power that you need is in your mouth. What am I saying? You have to have the, the ability and the desire to speak against the forces that are trying to take from what God has blessed you to have or trying to stop you from getting, getting to the place where God has called you to be. Ooh. This is not very common because we're not used to hearing it. But God is saying, this is a season where I want you to release the word of God into what you want. I want you to speak boldly concerning the things you want me to do for you. I'm reminded of the book of Psalms, chapter 81, verses 10, when the psalmist said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. What am I saying here? There's got to be some faith in the word of God. In other words, these feasts got Lord Jesus fulfilled. He fulfilled the first four, the last four. Three were the fall feast. He still has yet to fulfill the trumpet blast. We understand that's related to the rapture and all of that. But actually, the day of atonement, he's pretty much fulfilled that. And when he, when that trumpet sounded on the day of atonement, which signified the year of Jubilee, I have to bring that in because on that day, when the high priest went in, when he went in with, with the blood of bulls and goats and, and the, made that sacrifice. After he made that sacrifice, he, what did he do? He, he, um, he, he confessed the sins of the people over, 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 over uh, the goat. Then what did he do? There's one goat that he sacrificed. There's another goat that he confessed the sins over that goat. That goat was the scapegoat. It ran off into the wilderness. The Lord Jesus fulfilled that when he, and when that he uh, propitiated our sins. In other words, he, what did he do? He removed our sins or the, the first sacrifice appeased the wrath of God, but the sacri second sacrifice, which was the scapegoat expiated, which means it removed our sins far away. It opened up a door for us that you cannot imagine. In other words, everything that we need, everything that you desire for God to do was done at Calvary's cross. Some of the things that you have forgotten about, some of the things that you have given up on, and you said it is not possible. When the Lord Jesus hung on that cross and died on the cross for your sins, he became every sacrifice, past, present, and future. The, 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 the Africans have a saying, they say this word, they say, Damu ya Yesu, who sufficia kabisa, which means the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. That means I no longer have a sin debt. I no longer have to worry. In other words, I'm living in a year of jubilee, 24 hours a day, even though things are happening around me that I do not like or that I do not feel comfortable with. I have power through the word of God to call things that be not as though they already were because of his atoning work at Calvary's cross. What is happening? People are looking at the Bible, but it's, it's a will. In other words, if you see a will on your shelf, I'm coming to a close and there's a will, you have a will and, and somebody uh, passed away in your family and that will is just sitting there and it's just collecting dust and there's some money you need or, or we're not talking about money, but I'm just using it as an example or there's something that you need, but it's in that will. If you do not execute the will, nothing happens. So with God's word, you have to execute 
this will. In other words, there's everything that I need pertaining to life and godliness in this word. But if I don't do nothing with it, nothing will happen. So not only do I have to believe in the provision that he has made possible at Calvary's cross, but I have to activate that provision. And many people are, are, are falling to the wayside because they not, have not activated that provision. And what we're seeing is Satan is thriving on our ignorance of God's word, ignorance of the power that he had through his atoning work, ignorance of the power that we have when he, when he declared it is finished. We're ignorant of it, but I'm here to just remind you that you have power to lay hands over your sick body. You have power to lay hands over your feeble knees. You have power to lay hands over your children just because of what he did at Calvary's cross. There's so many people that come to the word of God with many desires and because of what they see happening to other people or around them, what I'm saying to you does not ring a bell because you've seen too many bad things happen around you. And even though those things may have happened, it doesn't determine what God is going to do for you. In other words, you don't base what you're going to do with God's word over what God did not do for somebody else. Because when he hung on that cross, according to John chapter 19, verses 30, he was letting you know that you have entered into a rest. In other words, you've entered into another, you're not even in the same category with everybody else. You've been transferred out of darkness into his marvelous light. Everything about you is new. Somebody said, I heard that before. Well, I'm going to remind you again, we have to get out of other people's opinions of what they think about God's word, because many things that we hear are people's philosophical viewpoints of what God is trying to say. But when you want to hear the word of God, you have to get in it and dig in it for yourself. Don't just take it from other people, because some people will tell you something based on what they think. But God is not in what we think. God is not, speaks from eternity into time, and he's not limited by what we think, no matter how good it may be. If it's not based on God's word, we got to learn how to discard it. In other words, if there's something standing in the way of my destiny, it has no right to be there because of what Jesus did at Calvary's cross. If there's something hindering me from getting to where God called me to be or causing me to miss out on what God called me to have, it has no right to be there because through the word of God, he has given me dominion over the forces that oppose me. We have to activate it. It is one thing to learn about the feast of, 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 of trumpets and to, and to really get into the feast of trumpets and to learn about what the Lord Jesus done through the day of atonement. But it is another thing to begin to activate it and begin to see manifestation. The Lord wants the manifestation to come through his people. In other words, he's not doing it through anybody else. He's going to do it through you. But he says, according to the book of Luke chapter 18, verse 8, when the son of man cometh, when he, when he gets ready to bless you, when he gets ready to open a door for you, shall he find faith on the earth? Or he's a, is he going to come knocking on your door and be introduced to doubt and reason and other people's opinions? and what they think and what they thought. That's why that Feast of Trumpets was important because it gave them some time for soul searching and introspection. What am I saying here? We don't do that often. There's a lot of us, we're so busy trying to help other people, trying to do stuff for this and trying to do this and trying to do that, that we very seldom to stop and think and re-examine our lives and reflect on what we need to do. There has to be some time where we come to a place where we stop for a while and begin to reflect, Lord God, what do you need me to do? Lord God, okay, I've repented of my sins. Lord, what are you calling me to do, Lord? Lord God, what are you speaking to me about? Lord God, this is my downtime. That was the beauty of the pandemic. It gave us a time to reflect. It gave us a time to slow down. And that is something that we need to emphasize. There has to be a period where you cut everybody off, everybody, and get to a place where God can deal with you about you. Because I'm telling you right now, we are in a season. The Bible says in the book of, of, um, of, of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 32, they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Amen. A lot of us don't know who he is. Amen. We know our bishop. We know our apostle. 
We know this person, but we don't have a clue who God is. My mind. We got to get to know who he is. The relevance of this feast is for us to have a fuller knowledge of who he, I feel the Holy Ghost, to have a fuller knowledge of who God is. Show us. So that we may access him with confidence and boldness. There is relevance to these feasts. Because what does it do? do? It shows us a manifestation of more of his power. Some people don't even know that Jesus fulfilled. Okay. God is God is good. God is good. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the time Thank right you. now for us to experience him and his Thank power. You. God bless you. God keep you. May he make his face to smile upon you. Amen. You. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory yeah. to God. Amen. Amen to God. That was yes. awesome. We don't want to break the flow. We're going to keep right on moving, and we're going to have a Bishop Scott Diver to come from Christ Church Triumphant, dealing with the Feast of the Tabernacles. Bishop Diver. Yes, Lord. Can't hear you. Unmute yourself, sir. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. Well, giving honor to the Lord Jesus, to our diocesan protocol has been established, and to our regional bishop, uh, Bishop Lawrence Neville, to our district elder, those that are here today. We're grateful for all you pastors. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity being able to share with you. Uh, I believe Pastor McCullough could have just took it on in, and we could have just went from there and went on home, but I'll... Uh, do a little piece what I can. I want to come from a eschatological, eschatological viewpoint uh, where it causes us to be a little more sensitive to the day as believers, as believers. I've always been a proponent that we have a Bible in one hand and either the news or the newspaper, if it's not tainted, to kind of be you know, exposed to what world events are. Uh, scriptures first but then also looking at the signs of the times. Uh, when we look at this Feast of Tabernacles, and then when it says the great day, which Jesus actually spoke of that in John 7, uh, when he said, if any man thirst, but to kind of look at this in a eschatology, eschatology viewpoint, uh, you kind of see three significant things uh, that it's going to happen because scripture must be fulfilled. Uh, as Pastor McCollum uh, referred to uh, the trumpets, uh, we understand that as spiritual believers, as the catching away of the church, the harpazo. I know some people use the word Latin term uh, rapture. Uh, Paul said caught up. That keeps us biblical, keeps us from people fighting with us over terminology. Uh, many times we use terms that we haven't defined or haven't discovered or even had definition with. The church is not supposed to be looking for Jesus' second coming. We as the church are supposed to be looking for his appearing. I'm a proponent of believing that Jesus is coming to take the church out. So I see that insignificance from an eschatological viewpoint, eschatological viewpoint, uh, that the church is going to be snatched out. Then when I look at atonement, to even look at it in the book of Revelation as a feast time, uh, you would look in Revelation chapter number 14, 15, and 16, you will see a pattern that we can walk with that that is the time of the vials and the tribulation and such like. But there is a 144,000, 12 tribes of Israel that sealed during that time. Revelation 14.1 talks about they had his name on their forehead. Revelation 15 and 3 talks about 
during this time while they're sealed, while the tribulation or the vials or, or the wrath, all that is being poured out. It's not affecting them as far as position while the whole world in that time is suffered because they are sealed. Uh, you see in this aspect that this is when they realize that Jesus is the one that they rejected the first time, but they see that he is the one that there's here in this, in this portion. Because if you notice Revelation 15 and 3, they were singing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. So there was a revelation to them during this time of, the tri of this tribulation of them being sealed that they were able to sing great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. They actually seen this. So in the pattern of future things, things that we're about to step in that I believe, uh, that we understand that that atonement can also be placed in the order of this is when Israel as a nation comes to full understanding that Jesus is the Messiah. The church has been taken out. Life is still moving on. The 144,000 now, which are the 12 tribes of, of Israel, now see the revealing that Jesus is both God and Christ. And then we come to the third aspect, which is uh, 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 the Feast of Tabernacles. When you look at it in an aspect of what the tabernacle is, it is a temporary dwelling place. What they did during that feast in their religious culture in the Old Testament, they would spend that time that during this pattern of the autumn festivals, they would make themselves temporal abodes to reenact the great deliverance that God had brought them through. Got to understand 40 day, or 40 years rather in the wilderness, and God was their shelter, even through all the things that they went through, even through all uh, 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 the rebelliousness and, and the things that God had to reprimand them in during that 40 years of testing. Uh, they still came out of there 20 years and under, understanding out of the wilderness, understanding that God has been their dwelling place the whole time. The tabernacle here, these little booths that they made for themselves, had to be at least three-sided. And in their, in their religious festival, they would have to spend the time, at least one time during the day, eating a meal in this temporary shelter. Now, some went to the extreme, and even to this day, some, some went to the extreme, that they would spend the whole period of time in the Feast of Tabernacles, dwelling in this temporary shelter. But it was to etch in their mind that no matter what the condition was, no matter what the situation was, God was their refuge. God is their shelter. This is what caused Moses to pen the 90th Psalm. Uh, if, you, if you look at Psalm 90 and 1, it says, uh, God, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. And then if you look at it in another psalm, he, he brought out uh, a he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shelter of the Almighty. So God was giving them an understanding that even though whatever they're going through in life, he was their shelter. They understand this in the Feast of Tabernacles, how we will understand it in the pattern of last things, the teaching of last things. There has to be the catching away of the church. There has to be a revealing of who Jesus is to the nation of Israel, the chosen of God the 144,000 that have been sealed and understand that what they rejected the first time, 
they now see the error of the way and they see that Jesus is Lord of all. Uh, this is why Paul brought it up in Romans when the Roman church started getting into this, what is classically termed as uh, 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 the understanding of, uh, of changing the understanding of, of who God's chosen are. In other words, it was called replacement theology. The Roman church got to the point because they started growing in vast numbers through the preaching of Paul and the preaching of Peter and their martyrdom and how they accepted the message and they began to uh, uh, give their lives over to Jesus and come out of Caesar's reign. Uh, they, they began to have this mindset that we must be the chosen of God. And Paul had to remind them that God has not done away with his people. It was because of their rejection is the only reason why we had full exposure to coming or be grafted in or be brought into the auspices of Jesus. And so between Romans chapter number nine, chapter number 10 of Romans and chapter number 11, he was doing away with the thought that there became replacement theology that now the church in Rome must be God's people. God says, or Paul said to him that God has never done away with the, his people. They're just blind in this season so we can come to full knowledge and acceptance and become grafted in and be the church. Then when you look at tabernacles, we need to look at it in an aspect of temporal dwelling, but God being our protection. I look at this whole season that we have never, our generation, the churches we know it now, we haven't really dealt with a pandemic. We never have really dealt with a shutdown. We've never had to deal with, you know, being put out of the church per se because of a, a disease situation, flu epidemic. Uh, and we've had to resort to temporary structures, whether it be what we're doing right now, uh, uh, talking to you via Facebook during the Ohio District Council being virtual a temporary dwelling, but God still being our protection. In other words, as the scripture says, an ever present help in the time of need. And so tabernacles, when they actually uh, worshiped in this feast, they were put in their head that this is a temporary situation, but God is going to bring us out. And so when you look at these three patterns in the aspect of doctrine of last things, uh, there has to be the catching away of the church. We have to be cognizant that we're looking for his appearing. We have to be cognizant that when we're out of the way, we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. There's going to be a time of atonement that the Jewish people that rejected him first are now going to receive him. It's just a few chapters before Revelation 14, 13, 14, and 15, or 14, 15, and 16, the two witnesses were slain, and then they rose back from the dead. And then all these things are going, these things are going to happen. These things are going to come to pass. What we as the church have to focus on, not being so tied up with this world, Paul told Timothy, that the good soldier is not tied up with the affairs of this life, where we're more concerned about certain situations that are temporal, whether we feel about a certain thing or not. And we get so caught up in the politicization of, uh, of temporal things that don't have eternal value. You know, no matter what side of the bird, if you're in the politics, no matter what you feel about a vaccine situation, we're supposed to be as the believer in Christ Jesus. We are supposed to be looking for his appearing. We should be biblical. And then also looking at the signs of the time. It's always been scripturally that we understand that God has always dealt in a 2000 uh, year time period. In the Jewish calendar, which is the calendar that's called God's timepiece, we're in the Gregorian calendar, but that's something that man made up. We got to look at how God patterns it and the timing of God. Right now in the Jewish aspect, we are in year 5782. 
I'm not date setting, but I want us to be sensitive to think about this. God has always dealt with us, mankind, man that he created. He's always dealt in patterns of 2,000. From Adam to Abraham, it was 2,000 years. From Abraham to the, Jesus was 2,000 years. We are now in God's calendar, God's timepiece. We're in the year 5782. Does that mean that year 6,000 would be significant? We don't know. But I would look, be venturing us enough to say every 2,000 years, God has done something significant to get mankind to understand that he is God. I look at the tabernacle feast, how it was dwelled into them, that this is temporal. God, I'm still going to bring you out. I'm still your God. You're still my people. You're in a wilderness situation. You're in a temporary housing. You're going through something. You've been brought out of Egypt. You're now wandering in a wilderness. There's things I'm still working out of. You tend to look at it in the aspect as I close. You look at it as the aspect. It could very well be the timepiece of the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus. The significant trumpets, the catching away of the church, atonement, the 144,000 during the tribulation being sealed, the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob, and the Feast of Tabernacles, where it lets us know that we are in a temporal situation, being led by an eternal God that neither slumbers nor sleeps that has never left us, has never forsaken us. And even though we're in the teaching of the end times, we should be looking that when we get caught up, there's still two more events in the doctrine of last things calendar. Israel will be delivered. And there's gonna be the millennial reign of the believers coming back with Jesus. And there's going to be that thousand year period that we rank, then you'll understand which is not the topic today. There'll be some other things that go on. And then when we understand the great day, I look at that in what Jesus said in the actual Feast of Tabernacles. He said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And we are living in the day that we should be more thirsty for the appearing of the Lord. As Paul said, you know, uh, there's mystery. Uh, the dead in Christ mm -hmm. are going to rise first, not that they're going to be ahead of us, but they're going to rise first. And while they're going up, we that are alive and remain uh, will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. But we're going to be caught up together mm -hmm. to meet the Lord in the air. Oh. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. <laughs> God bless you for the time that I could share. We can get into things, but I want to be obedient to the time allotment. God bless you, High District Council. I hope this was enlightening, enlightening to let us just know some significant things, not argue about stuff that has no significance, but right. be concerned about where our future is. Hallelujah. Mm, mm, mm. Awesome. Oh, my God. Well, this could just go on and on. But at this time, we're going to turn the furtherance of our service into the hand of our great leader in the person of Suffolk and Bishop Nevels, who's going to be sounding the alarm and taking us further. God bless you, Suffolk and Bishop Nevels. Blessings, blessings to you, Pastor Brown. And we do thank the Lord for the, uh, the teaching of his word, the preaching of his word. We have had um, a, um, I would say, uh, a, a meaty meal. My this, was God. A, this was a meaty meal. That, Hallelujah. Not, not, not soup and sandwiches, but this Steak. was some meat today. <laughs> I want to thank the Lord for uh, what Pastor McCollum and Bishop Dybert have shared with us. By no means can we uh, wrap all of this up, but we were wanting to just kind of uh, prepare our hearts. The Lord has been uh, 
impressing upon me the need for um, the church, mm -hmm. the council, and of course, all of us to pay attention to what is important to him. Yes. To what is important to him. And that is the reason even for our um, dealing with the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacle. May it be that um, you would come back perhaps on the next council, as I spoke to our speakers, uh, by no means were we going to exhaust the subject. We just wanted to kind of get into it a little bit. And um, maybe the next time Bishop uh, Divert will we'll have another opportunity to kind of unravel some of these, uh, uh, these feasts and, and get into it so that we can have an understanding because we want to be uh, attuned to what the Lord is saying for this time. Amen. 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 We have uh, we have worshipped today uh, through song. Uh, District Elder and Sister Oz have led us in a song. We have worshipped through the reading of His Word. We have worshipped through preaching, and it's time for us to worship. Uh, through giving, time for us to worship through giving. And I want to uh, read a passage of scripture that is found in the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 90, Psalm 96 and verse 7. Give to the Lord, O kindreds of the people. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. There is the call that when we do come and when we worship as we have worshiped, that we are to not only bring our song and bring our prayer but and ourselves, but we are to bring an offering. And um, it is appropriate for us to make an appeal to those of you who are listening to this um, morning glory to bring an offering and I submit to you Psalm 20 may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble may the name of the God of Jacob defend you may he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion and then verse 3 says may he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices to the great council, we do ask for you to contribute and to give an offering out of the abundance of your heart, not so much to try to pay God back, but to say, Lord, I thank you for your benevolence and for your goodness. Mm -hmm. You can give through Givelify. You can give through Givelify by checking the app and Ohio District Council Pentecostal Churches, if you are using the app Givelify, Ohio District Council Pentecostal Churches, or you may give through Cash App, and the Cash App address is dollar sign ODC Main, M-A-I-N. And um, I'm sure that there are other times that you will see where you can uh, send a check or you can give. Um, we do still take cash. We still do and we'll receive a cash offering as well. Now may the Lord bless you and heaven smile upon you is our prayer. We wish not to uh, belabor or hold you, but we do want to always um, do what the apostle Paul uh, did and what uh, John the Baptist did. They sounded an alarm. They provoked the people to think and to pray and to consider. Jesus Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. He is coming again. He is coming again. And as Bishop Dybert pointed out, amen, for us today, not only the rapture, but the saints of God looking for and anticipating his appearing. Hallelujah. John said it this way, even so, come Lord Jesus. Mm. Even so, come Lord Jesus at the conclusion of the book of Revelation when he reveals himself. He who testifies of these things says, surely I come quickly. Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. 
And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this morning glory. Thank you for speaking uh, to our hearts through your man servants, through your woman servants, through your people. We thank you, Lord. We are uh, attuning our ear to your voice. And now as we go through the remainder uh, of this day, would you be glorified in our hearts, be glorified in our lives, be magnified, Lord, in our dwelling. And may you draw people unto yourself as we lift your name on high. We commit all things into your hands with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let the church say, let the church say amen. 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 You can unmute yourself.